Okay, welcome to the chapter on breast pathology. Um, the very first point that I'd like to make is actually a point from embryology, and that is that the breast is a modified skin gland. So what happens is you get an involution of the skin, um, and that eventually results in the breast, so that, again, the breast is derived from the skin. Uh, one important thing to know about embryology of the breast, which is particularly high yield, is that the breast actually develops from uh, something called the milk line, uh, and the milk line actually runs all the way from the axilla down to the vulva. So if you, drew, if you took a point at the axilla and then took another point at the vulva and just sort of made a straight line, breast tissue can develop anywhere along that line, and that line is called the milk line. And so, for example, patients can have extra nipples, and the nipples could be anywhere along that line. Patients can actually have extra breast tissue, and that breast tissue can be anywhere along that line. Um, and so can pathology. So, for example, they can have breast cancer anywhere along that line as well. Uh, it's relatively rare to, for these types of disorders to occur, but of course what's rare shows up on exams, so it's important to be aware of it. Now the functional unit of the breast histologically is called the terminal duct lobular unit. Uh, and the idea here is that you've got this duct, and this duct feeds into something called a lobule, and the lobule contains these little glandular spaces, and these little glandular spaces, they are the lobules that make milk. So uh, this is the lobule, and this is the duct. It's the job of the lobule to make milk, and then it's the job of the duct to drain that milk out to the nipple. And this functional unit here, this entire thing, this is the terminal duct, the very end of the duct, and this is the lobule. So that's called the TDLU, or the terminal duct lobular unit. Here's a picture of that histologically. So you can see that this would be, for example, the terminal duct cut on end, and then you've got all these little lobular spaces with this entire thing represent representing the lobule, and then all these little glandular spaces, which would be producing the milk in the proper physiologic context. So this is, um, that's the normal histology. Now one super high yield point to be aware of is that all the ducts in the breast and all of the lobules in the breast, so the entire basically breast epithelium is actually two layers of epithelium, such that if you were to look at the epithelium of the breast, it would look like the following. Let's take a duct, for example. So this is a duct. Uh, and one of the important things is that the duct would obviously be lined by a layer of epithelial cells, and these epithelial cells are also called luminal cells. Uh, these luminal cells in the duct, they play a role to protect the duct, so they're the protective layer of the duct. In the lobule, they play the role of making the milk. Now, underneath these luminal cells will always be another set of cells called myoepithelial cells. They're called myo because they have contractile function, and they're called epithelial because they help to produce the epithelial lining of this particular um, space. And so myoepithelial cells, they contain contractile function, and it's their contractile function that helps to squeeze the duct to push the milk forward. But again, super high yield. The, the ducts and lobules each are lined by two layers of epithelium, uh, an inner luminal layer and an outer myoepithelial layer. Going one step further, we should remind ourselves that the breast tissue is hormone sensitive. So when you look at breast epithelium, it contains both estrogen and progesterone receptors, and that is, those receptors are necessary because it's estrogen and progesterone that are going to drive the development of the breast. For example, um, when you look at a boy or a girl, they both have minimal breast tissue underneath the subareolar region. However, once a girl goes through uh, puberty and begins to uh, produce estrogen and progesterone, then there's going to be significant development of the breast after menarche. Um, the lobules are going to begin to develop and the breast will begin to expand. And it's important to note anatomically in this particular context that the highest density of breast tissue in a female actually ends up being in the upper outer quadrant of the breast. So in the upper outer quadrant of the breast anatomically is the highest density of breast tissue. That's actually a high yield principle as you'll see um, moving forward. Uh, another important uh, consequence of the breast being hormone sensitive is that there's breast tenderness during the menstrual cycle. Uh, so that's another sign of the breast being hormone sensitive. Um, another consequence is that there's hyperplasia during pregnancy. Remember that during pregnancy, there's a lot of estrogen and progesterone produced. You can go back to normal physiology and remind yourself that the corpus luteum produces a ton of uh, estrogen and progesterone in the very first about 10 weeks of pregnancy. And then after that, the placenta produces progesterone and the fetal placental unit produces estrogen. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that the estrogen and progesterone during pregnancy, they will drive development of the breast so that the breast becomes bigger. And of course, we want it to become bigger because it's eventually going to produce the milk necessary for the baby. 
Um, and then finally, when a woman undergoes menopause and the amount of estrogen and progesterone decrease, then the breast atrophies. So all of these are basically signs of hormonal sensitivity of breast tissue. The very first um, disorder that we want to talk about is called galactorrhea. Galactorrhea refers to the production of milk. However, it is outside of lactation. All right? So if a woman is breastfeeding, she doesn't have galactorrhea. But if she is producing milk and she's not feeding, i.e. she's not recently pregnant, etc., then we call that galactorrhea. Now the first thing I'd like to remind you of is the production of milk is not a symptom of breast cancer. So you're not going to find galactorrhea in the context of breast cancer. All right, so galactorrhea is not related to breast cancer. Now what are some things that can cause galactorrhea? Well, there's a common, there's a, one important physiologic cause and then there are some common pathologic causes. A physiologic cause could be nipple stimulation. So if there's excessive nipple stimulation, that can actually result in overproduction of milk by the breast. In fact, what's particularly interesting is that if a woman adopts a baby and would like to try to breastfeed that baby, uh, there are techniques where she can undergo nipple stimulation and that would result in the production of milk. So galactorrhea could be seen with excessive nipple stimulation. Also, a prolactinoma of the anterior pituitary, which would produce prolactin, which would then get into the blood, hit the breast, and then cause it to produce milk. That could result in galactorrhea. And finally, we can see galactorrhea as a consequence of a side effect of some drugs. Um, and so these are the few important causes to be aware of concerning galactorrhea. And that closes off our introduction, and we're going to move to inflammatory conditions in the next section.